somewhere in my mid thirties, I said, I'm not, if there's ever a pebble, I'm going to examine it. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we are covering productivity, how to work smarter and focus on the right things. But we'll also be going deeper to talk about philosophy and optimizing your life for aliveness. Our guest today is Kay He. Kay He is the founder and CEO of Rad Reads, an online education company that helps professionals lead productive, examined, and joyful lives. Kay is creator of the 10 K work productivity method and teaches the popular cohort based course, supercharge your productivity. Rad reads provides guides, trainings, and coaching for over 40,000 professionals to help them gain back free time, scale their impact and make their little dent in the universe. Today is actually Kay's second time on the podcast. The last time he was on was way back in 2017. So if you go back to episode 44, you can find our episode where Kay talked about his journey leaving Wall Street after 14 years in search of happiness and fulfillment. So listen to that episode if you want more info on his backstory. But today we're learning about his life since then and what he has to share about productivity. Hello, Kay. Welcome back to the podcast after a very long, very long t- p- uh, point in time. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It has been uh, in in dog years. <laughs> I can't even. I can't even keep track. No, I'm so happy to have you back because I feel like we're both in a different era of our lives and business now. And uh, yeah, I'd love to start with um, an update. You know, since we last spoke, it was probably 2016, maybe. Yeah, in that era. So what have you been doing since then? How Mm -hmm. have you grown and evolved? Yes, it's, um, God, it, it feels like so, so long ago, right? So I, when we spoke, I had just began my journey as a creative online entrepreneur. Yeah. I was and you were working up, on Wall Street, right? Yeah, I had come yeah. off the back of a 14-year career on Wall Street. So like I was I did I was a total noob when we spoke. Uh, I'll have to dig into the archive and go rewatch that just to, to to resituate myself. But so I started online, I call myself the accidental entrepreneur. I'm an accidental creative. I never like set out to do any of this stuff. And it just keeps finding me. And in the, you know, seven years since we last spoken, uh, I spent a lot of time writing. So the, I read a newsletter, Re- Rad Reads Weekly Newsletter. We're on the 389th issue, 40,000 subscribers. So that's kind of like a core thing. I write, I'm still, I'm still old school. I still blog every, every week. I write a 800 to 2000 word essay. Um, and from that, I've done a bunch of coaching. Uh, we launched a cohort-based course during COVID called Supercharge Your Productivity, which covers this productivity framework that we developed that we're probably going to talk about today called 10K Work. And I think that the other thing is I've become more um, passionate about kind of philosophy. And so productivity is a lot of the how. And I've become with age, I have two, two kids, I have a new kid since we spoke. Um, the, I'm much more concerned like with the why, like, why do we do these things? I love that. Um, yeah. My next question that I was going to ask you is, I, I think I got a feel for that, that you care about philosophy. Cause I wanted to ask you to tell us about your approach to life. Like what is this perspective that you've developed over the years? Ooh, I think it has to it has to begin with uh, a brief story of how I grew up. Child of first generation Cambodian immigrants moves to New York City. There's civil war going on in Cambodia. Uh, barely any money. Barely speak the language. No friends. No family. My parents. Their whole life was work hard. We will do everything for your opportunity and your education. All you have to do is show up and work hard, and then you'll get a great job, and then you'll be happy. Everything else is not relevant <laughs> in there in that story. Dating, um, creativity, um, you know, sports, sports, unless they were going to get you into college, um, and feelings, right? Like, like I've never seen my dad. I've seen my dad cry once, and he's experienced a lot of loss 
in his life. So it's that whole kind of stereotype. Don't show your emotions. If you're my, my dad would always say, if you're thinking about how you feel, you should get back to work. And so uh, that was kind of the framing of, you know, Wall Street productivity, like the more intense productivity. But I say like I had what I call the pebble in my shoe, which was just like, you know, when you have something in your shoe and you're walking and it's kind of annoying and it's kind of a latent anxiety, but you're too lazy to stop, take your shoe off, take the thing out, put your shoe back on. And you're just like, I'm just going to deal. Right. And somewhere in my mid thirties, I said, I'm not, if there's ever a pebble, I'm going to examine it. And I've just kind of taken that to every single facet of my life, my relationship with my kids, my relationship with success and ambition, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my frenemies, my relationship with envy and comparison and all that. And like, people are like, Hey, you're an overthinker. I'm like, no, the overthinking is what brings clarity to my life, which brings the thing that I, that I, now I know what I want is I just want to, like, I want my mind to be at peace, right? I want to be calm. I think like I, I surf. So it's like, it's like, I want it to be not like surfing. Like I just want a chill, still pond. Right. I love that. So, so how do you live your life now after you started examining the pebbles? Mm, wow. Um, my friend once gave me a compliment and he said, Kay, what I admire about you is not that you're a good entrepreneur, not that you're a good writer. I'm like, oh, damn, where's he going with this? <laughs> uh, he's like, what I admire about you is that you know exactly what you want and exactly what you don't want. Uh, and I'm like, ooh, that's a nice, yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. a, that's a sign of wisdom, right? And I'm you like, take you. time to really think everything through. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I've kind of built my life around the things that I love how I want to show up, what's going on in between these two, you know, in between these two ears. And um, the thing that I'm always, quote unquote, optimizing for is aliveness. Ooh, like, I want to feel I alive. That. I want to feel alive when I work. I want to feel alive in my conversation with fellow entrepreneurs. I want to feel alive in my marriage. I want to feel alive with my kids. It's like, what's the, you know, what's the, what's the opposite of feeling alive? It's feeling dead inside. Right. And so, so much of that. And look, when you start to probe and look within, you start to see, you know, I had a very nice, stable upbringing, but you start to see some, some weird stuff, right? You know, a lot of the immigrant mindset kind of backfires a bit where, you know, you're not allowed to enjoy things or you're not allowed to feel right. And you, you need to like, it takes years to unlearn a, you need to notice that they exist. And then B, to unlearn them. So what does that look like in practical terms? Um, my life's super chill. Like today, I didn't do anything. But today's a Friday. Yeah. I, I just like, I surfed. Uh, I was going to like, I went to the post office. I cleaned the kitchen. I listened to a few YouTube. I watched a few YouTube videos. I read. I wrote a few tweets. I did research. It's like, I used to shame myself for having a day like that. Right. Because it's not like my business is booming and thriving. Right. But I'm like, this is the this is exactly the Friday that I want to have after this. I'm going to go work out and then we're going to watch beef. We're going to finish beef on Netflix. So a few things that that means is um, I make very deliberate choices about who I spend my time with. Um, I, I basically don't spend time with people who bring me negative, who bring negative energy into the room. So mm -hmm. I'm very deliberate about that. Uh, I protect my non-negotiables, and those are quality time with my kids and wife, um, walking them to school, eating dinner with them. Um, I don't travel much. I'm just around. I'm around a lot. Like I want to. I'm not a co-parent, equal co-parent. My wife is the primary caretaker, uh, but I'm around all the time. I'm just always around my kids, and um, and I can be off with them for two weeks on my own. So that's another thing. And then, um, and then I surf. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I don't schedule meetings until 1130. Surfing is a very fickle sport because you're at the whims of mother nature. So you, you can't plan it. You can't plan surfing. So since I can't plan it, I just block out a huge amount of time and prioritize surfing and then everything else falls into place. 
I've got a small team. We did encounter some troubles kind of coming out of COVID. And so we had to downsize. I've got a, I've got two, um, colleagues. So, you know, we, we, we work together fully, fully asynchronously working on content, working on some of our courses and working on our different, different products, but it's pretty simple. And, and, uh, it just passes. I always ask myself this one test. If yesterday somehow this gigantic sum of money showed up in my bank account, like a, a billion dollars shows up in my bank account. What would my day look like today? And I always want that day to look as close as possible to what the day actually looks like. Because more money is, you know, we're fine financially. More money is not changing anything in the quality of my life. I feel very lucky about that. Um, a lot of that comes from having worked on Wall Street for many years and saving well. Uh, but it's just like, if, if there was a billion dollars in my bank account, I would still be excited to talk to you because I believe I love your work. I believe in your, what your message, we're going to have a fun conversation. I would still work out. I would still surf. And so I'm just always kind of asking that question. I call it the lottery test. Before we go on, let's take a break for our sponsor, When Skin. While most skincare products only temporarily treat the surface symptoms of aging, One Skin is a brand that applies science and research to actually reverse the root causes of aging. Founded by a team of four female PhD level longevity scientists with over 15 years of experience, One Skin addresses skin health at the molecular level, targeting the root causes of aging so skin behaves feels and appears younger. How you ask? They combine tissue engineering, data analysis, and cutting edge longevity science to create their products with their OS01 peptide as the primary active ingredient to help your skin resist the effects of aging. I've been using their face moisturizer and eye cream twice a day to improve the fine lines around my eyes and forehead. I also appreciate that their packaging is reusable and refillable. If you're ready to get started with your new skincare routine, you can get 15% off with the code TLL at oneskin.co. That's 15% off at oneskin.co with the code TLL. We only have one body, one skin, and only you can choose to make it better. Age healthy with one skin. That's so amazing. I, I love everything that you said. I, I love that you know your values. It is true. You know what you want, what you don't want, and you're living. You, you. I love the anchor of like I'm optimizing for aliveness. Like everything you do, you want to feel alive. And it's honestly, I can relate to what you say so much because the Lavender brand is all about creating your dream life, and that looks different for everyone, right? For you, it's surfing and having like a full day to do nothing. Like I, to be honest, I, a part of me like wants to be more like that too. Like I want to have an open day where I have nothing, no obligations. But then there's also other, you know, mm -hmm. I like to do a lot too. So I fill yeah. up my day with things and to-do lists. Um, yeah, but it sounds to me also that you're you're very active in your mind. You probably mm. are an overthinker. So being someone like that, how were you able to do less <laughs> Ooh, and so, find that peace? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because it's mm. we all want peace, right? But mm -hmm. then we also have all these other things pulling us here and there. Yes. I, I think a lot about this and I, I, one, one of kind of where I've landed on this through a lot of this kind of self-examination therapy, journaling, reading is, um, I'm not saying you, you are, but you may consider yourself. I am what I call, uh, an achievement addict. And so I'm addicted to achievement. And so if you think about, and again, I don't want to sound pejorative to like people who have real addictions, but if you think about, you know, traditional addictions, alcohol, gambling, sex, whatever, um, you know, society, it kind of like, they're like, oh, that's, that's not good. Like we all know that that's, those aren't good addictions, but when someone is addicted to achievement, society celebrates that. Mm -hmm. They put you on the cover of magazines, people tweet about you, people write books about you. And it's that same sensation, right? When you drink, it's like your dopamine and your pleasure receptors, they fire and you're like, you feel good for a short amount of time and then it dissipates and then you want more, right? That's how an addiction builds. I think 
that I am, uh, I've self-diagnosed myself as an achievement addict because I'm always thinking about how can I, even with all the Zen that I just presented to you, I'm always thinking about how I can achieve better. Hell, I'm looking at this camera right now. I'm like, oh, should I, you know, do I need a different lens, right? <laughs> you know, to make, to have a better bokeh fine. effect. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but that's the thoughts that are growing through my mind. My mic right. might not be good enough. Um, and because every time someone, you know, you, you said a few nice things about me already, like it feels good. And so my brain is addicted to that feeling. And it knows through 43 years of, of processing that when you work, chances are you're going to get some of that feeling. And there's an extra layer. And why is that feeling so intoxicating is because so much of my self-worth I derive in my own eyes comes from this achievement. So I'm an addicted to this dopamine that also fuels my self-worth, right? Which is almost like a form of conditional self-love. Mm -hmm. It's like if you kind of really yeah. break that apart, break that down, what I'm saying to myself is you're only as good to yourself as your next achievement. And so that, 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 that implies a lot of things. It implies like, how do you break that cycle? That's one thing. But I think there's an even more fundamental question, which is, who am I without achievement? Right? Mm -hmm. Because my kids would be like, I love you irrespective of whether you achieve or not. My wife would actually say, I wish you would be less of a high achiever because you would be more relatable. And so they're not putting that pressure on me. I'm putting that pressure on me. And so it, that requires going inwards and really kind of build, rebuilding your sense of self, your self sense of identity from the ground up. And man, no one teaches you how to do that. Yeah. I, I'm like nodding this whole time because that's exactly what I've been working to also undo the past three or four years. Because I, I think whether it's the immigrant mindset or whatever, but I also had that high achieving tendency, the addiction to the positive feedback you get. Also be, I think any content creator has yes. this issue because you get that dopamine when you have oh this number of views, this number of likes, and, and it just feels good to keep getting it. And, and, and so your self-worth goes up and down based on your level of success or level of achievement. So anyway, I, I that's, I, I can 100% re relate to your journey. So how have you been, I guess, undoing that? What have you learned? Well, there's a few things. One is just noticing it. Like I, the way that I just described that to you in the past five, seven minutes, that's taken me like 10 years of therapy to deconstruct, right? I, I, it seems so obvious, like laid out so methodically, but just noticing that it was even, I mean, people go their whole lives without noticing that that's their programming. Yep. Yep. Right. So that would be the first one, noticing it. Um, the second one, I would say there, there's a few. It's like is um, identifying like what's enough, mm -hmm. right? What's enough? Obviously, what's enough car? What's enough money? What's enough followers, right? I mean, you know that the game of 200,000 followers and two, 20 million followers, it's a different game, right? It comes with a very different set of challenges and benefits, Right. So what is enough? And I, I always think about this question, like, what is enough? What, it, what would I do if I had more money? You know, I've actually gotten very much at peace with the money thing because I don't I don't I mean, I'll take more money, but I'm not I don't need it. Right. Right. And that's one. The second is um, reconnecting with my childhood self. And so here I've been kind of I'm in the very early days of this, but um, there is a therapy modality called Internal Family Systems, IFS. And there's a book called No Bad Parts, um, which basically says that, that it's like so many of these achievement behaviors are the child in you that was like fighting with a sibling to get love or that was a social reject in high school that got teased. And you're like, oh, I'm going to prove you wrong and I'm going to become the biggest YouTube creator in the world and watch you like high school bully. You're like, I'll show you who I am. Right. And, um, and for me, I think a lot of it was, I was very shy, very insecure. I still am pretty insecure about a lot of things. Um, 
But a lot of it was, I actually traced it back just through reading these books and thinking they have you like talk to you, like uh, talk to a younger you, like as, as a child and like have like extended conversations. It's, it's kind of wild stuff. But that kid, I realized never felt safe. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, we were middle class, but you know, I was small kid and you live in New York in the nineties, like people would just, kids would get mugged by other kids. They would steal your lunch money. They would take your backpack. Like it was not uncommon whether you were upper class or lower class. It just was a part of growing up in New York. And I remember sobbing to my parents being like, I hate living here. I feel so scared going to school. This kid stole my backpack. Like, and they're just like, toughen up. Like, and I don't blame them, right? Like we couldn't move, right? Our lives were there. And so when I look back and I talk to that kid and I feel what they were feeling, like it's a lot of that drive is because I wanted to feel safe as a 12 year old. And I can't shake that feeling of wanting to be safe. And now safety is like create more Instagram reels. And, you know, there, there's like this weird um, transformation of what safety means. So that would be another one. And then a big one. I don't love to like, broadcast it because I think it's a very personal thing, but I I spent a lot of time in in quiet. And so meditation, Mm -hmm. I walk a lot without music. I'm just like, I really, I I force myself to drive without listening to anything. Not always. I do that. I do that too. (laughs) Yeah. Like, let's just be present. Let's just practice being present. Yeah. Uh, And then lots of therapy and coaching. Yeah. Getting coached. I think it's a little ironic then because I... Like, you know, I feel like this journey is detaching your productivity and achievements from your sense of self-worth. So it is a little ironic that you teach productivity, but it does fit, right? So how, how do you define productivity and, you know, what does that mean to you now? You know, it's funny. I was like thinking about some of the old things I used to obsess with, you know, you know, um, getting things done, GTD and, um, different uh, like cold showers and, t- you know, t- Tabata workouts and Tabata burpees. And the thing is, like, I still do all of those things. Like, I've internalized a lot of those behaviors, but I don't, A, my identity is detached, is really starting to be detached. I'm, I'm 43 years old. Like, I, I'm not, I'm a grown man with kids. Like, I don't need to be talking about productivity mm-hmm. in, the, in the tactics sense of, of the word. Um, but I still use all those things because productivity to me is, um, how do you, it's basically, how do you create the space for yourself mentally and time-wise for that aliveness to shine through? Mm. Right. If you're worrying about a bill that needs to be paid, that is a tax on your aliveness. Right. I never worry about bills because I, because I use a very good bill paying system. Right. Um, and so to me, you know, I think in the, in the past productivity was the thing to achieve in it of itself, kind of like money, like you just wanted to have money. And now it is a thing to achieve in it's a means, not the end. So I think in my twenties and thirties, productivity was the end. And in my forties, productivity is the means. All right, let's take another break to hear about today's sponsor, Jenny Kane. It's Mother's Day, which means it's a great time to treat yourself or the women in your life to something special. Jenny Kane's California-inspired clothes are the perfect blend of minimalism and luxury, with classic and comfortable pieces that last. Jenny Kane is known for their luxuriously lightweight sweaters. I have their cashmere cocoon cardigan in the color oatmeal, and it's that perfect neutral beige tone that matches everything in my closet. It's incredibly cozy, soft, and oversized perfect for everyday wear. With a focus on comfort, quality, and timeless design, Jenny Kane makes pieces that truly never go out of style. They're clothes that you can wear every day in many different ways. Perfect for your wardrobe staples or pieces for your capsule wardrobe. Find your forever pieces at JennyKane.com. Our listeners get 15% off your first order when you use the code TLL at checkout. That's 15% off your first order at Jenny 
A-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E.com with the promo code T-L-L. Mamas, this is your month. You deserve it. Oh, that makes so much sense. Before, you're just trying to be productive for the sake of doing more. Now, productivity gives you, it allows you to live the life you want to live, like whether it's giving you more time to like have fun. and Exactly. And, okay, exactly. I get it. So productivity still is important because it allows us to live the life we want to live. Absolutely. I've still got very complex systems. Um, I still have all the tools. I still, you know, quick capture and, and all those things. Uh, but it, but, but it has evolved. Um, and, and, and I'm happy to share how, how it's evolved and kind of how I approach it in a more pra- pragmatic sense. Yeah. Let's go into that. So how, what are the things you do? <laughs> I will start with the, the actual framework, um, which we call 10K work. And 10K work, again, now the creator in me, it's like I threw so many ideas against the wall to try to come up with the thing that resonated with me, with the audience that like was easy to communicate. And 10K work was one of these things that, that really, really emerged. So uh, I'm sure you'll link to it, uh, yeah. but there's a matrix, a two by two matrix. We can and put it four... on the screen while you're yeah, talking exactly. about it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, perfect. So there's four <laughs> quadrants. Uh, well, let's talk about the axes. Uh, one axis is low skill and high skill. And then one axis is low leverage and high leverage. And leverage is really, if you're, I'm a finance guy, so it's like amplifying your financial returns. It, it's an amplifier, a force multiplier. Of things, right? So you could think of like your YouTube channel as a very leveraged thing because you record one video and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. I don't even know where your subscriber count is at. People will see it. It's a very highly uh, leveraged thing. The color of the Tiffany's box, that blue, is a very powerful form of leverage because anyone can be walking around with that color and 80% of people will be like, oh, that's Tiffany's. So it's one one action that has this like really kind of compounding compounding effect, just like 10k work, right? People now write about they write blog posts about 10k work. I don't have to ask them to write it; they just go and do it. So that idea has a tremendous amount of leverage. So we can talk about different forms of leverage. So every quadrant, this is where it gets fun. Every quadrant has a dollar value, and it's not like you're not earning that money, but it's like a metaphor. So you have $10 work, which is low skill, low leverage, right? And my test for for that is, can you do this with a hangover? Um, So if you could do it with a hangover, fill, you know, inbox zero, communications, updating reports, like that's $10 work. $100 work is low skill, high leverage. So you're amplifying something, but it might be the wrong thing. And so you, I, I'm a big Notion person. I, I use Notion a lot, the productivity tool. Mm-hmm. But people spend months customizing their Notion. Like they're like, I, I need to, I want to be a writer. I want to be a YouTuber. And they create this like crazy YouTube workflow in Notion with calendars and this and drop downs and all this stuff. But they don't record a video. <laughs> Right. And the problem with that is that it's kind of like the where I shy, I'm a little repelled by productivity is because a lot of productivity is in that quadrant. It like gives you the illusion that you're, you know, it's better than the work you can do hungover, but it's not like move. You know, I always say for a hundred dollar work, ask yourself, where do I want to be in five years? And is the thing that I'm working on, like let's use the notion dashboard in this example, gonna take me there? And if the answer is no, then you're in the hundred dollar category. Mm -hmm. $1,000 work is high skill, low leverage, meaning that it is the thing that you're good at. But so for example, um, you know, if I do coaching, that's a skill, I'm good at it, I'm, I get an income from it. uh, But there's no scale, right? If I take a one year of a sabbatical, the money stops coming in, right? So same if you're a W-2 employee, like you can't just take a sabbatical. So there's no leverage in there. Like the thing doesn't keep going. So then 10K work is the high skill, high leverage is where you're able to actually amplify. So again, take that, that example, like what if I downloaded my brain to five of my colleagues and they could write 80% as well as me, right? That's huge amount of leverage. 
right? What if um, we created a great onboarding process for a new employee? And so they get all the information and I don't have to sit and talk to them. That's extremely high leverage. What if we create frameworks that people talk about that we reuse in videos and trainings and coaching, creating that framework, creating brand identity, right? Um, partnerships, business development, like those are very high. Like I could, there's a Wall Street Journal reporter that I email with from time to time. Like if they write about rad reads, it's huge for us, right? So building a relationship with a reporter is a, is a, a very high leverage activity. And so mm-hmm. everyone has to do all four of those buckets. But again, kind of like the introspection stuff where we talked about, you know, knowing yourself, just the awareness of like, oh, wow, I did a lot of $10 work today, <laughs> right? You're like, yeah. I just did a lot of that hungover box checking work. Uh-huh. And that's okay. Some days mm-hmm. you need to do that. You can't just be daydreaming and like pitching Wall Street Journal reporters all day. Uh, but having that nice portfolio approach. And so that's kind of the the anchor to to our productivity system. And that really just moves the needle because I can quickly ask myself, did I do any 10K work today? Mm. What's my 10K work? So is your goal to do something in the 10K work quadrant every day? Or yes. Okay, I see. And then can you clarify leverage again? Because even with the, the $100 work when you're explaining, how is a Notion template that's not effective. How is that one hundred dollar work? It's a hundred dollar work, and a hundred dollar work is um, it, it. You know, we can get to like splitting hairs here, but a hundred uh, uh, maybe a better example of a hundred dollar work is um, a text expander, right? And you have all these phrases that you use over and over and over again. And so you input them into your text expander, and then you can you know like when you're pitching a podcast. You just do slash podcast and it writes this, you know, super long email for you. Okay. Um, That's super helpful. Yeah. But you're not going to be a better podcaster Mm. just because you have that thing. Okay. Yeah. Right. And sometimes there's a trap where people get so focused on the tools. Yeah. Because it feel, feel you that. feel like you could trick yourself in that example. You could be like, I'm becoming a better podcaster by doing this. Like, no, no, no. You are not becoming a better podcaster by automating some part of your podcasting workflow. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but don't trick yourself. Don't delude yourself into thinking that you're becoming a better podcaster by, you know, automating some process. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's it's not getting to the core of what makes your work good, but it it is helping. It's helping something. It's totally helpful. Yes. Okay. Can you give us examples then of what is 10K work? Like what what have you seen in like different industries? Yeah. um, So a classic example of 10K work is hiring the right people. So it's recruiting and retain, uh, recruiting, onboarding, engaging, and retaining. And that doesn't mean just, you know, W2 employees at a Fortune 500 company that could be contractors that we work in. So imagine... That if, you know, I know you, you, uh, there are a lot of creatives listening. Um, what if, you know, and I'm not a hardcore creative, so some of my language might be off, but, but let's say, uh, you bring in a, a, a contractor an Upworker or something, and you, you need like a bunch of Instagram assets, right? You could sit and talk to them and I like this, I like this, I like this, or you could have invested the time to create a style guide. Mm-hmm. So creating a style guide is leverage because the person walks in, you just slide that paper across the room and they're like, they hit the ground running, right? Uh, Another way, again, in the land of creativity, um, a very one that I'm trying to crack right now in um, short form video is having a good format. Once you find the format of a video that works really well for you, your style in your audience and your ideas, then it's mm. so high leverage. I see what you're saying. Right? Yeah, but sometimes that it's, it's about yeah, creating the framework that makes something really work. Yeah. Like exactly. that's more important cuz you can create like you know how they say be consistent to be a content creator, but you can create a bad video every single day versus if you find like a key format, a way to package it. So that's what you mean by leverage, like it just like yeah. amplifies it. Exactly, because okay. then the if you, for, for example, I've done 
180 days of shorts and they're not, they're not breaking through. Mm. Um, and I'm not, I know I'm not really a video person, so there's a little steep learning curve for a lot of stuff, but I think part of the reason why they're not breaking through is because I haven't found that format yep. that suits me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm getting closer. Uh, yeah. I've had one or two go pop like viral in, in my, my, my terms. So I'm getting closer. And so I'm constantly trying to figure out what's that format, what's that format, what's that format. Um, and then the other thing, um, is a lot of 10 K work is, is just making the time to think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Instead of doing um, the busy work, the little admin things, checking email, but like really, how do you think about your work? Exactly. Exactly. And I tell a lot of aspiring creators, young creators earlier in their journey, uh, than me, um, I'm a generalist creator, so I just, I can't niche down cause I just hate niching. But it's kind of hurt me because if you ask 10 people what does Rad Reads stand for, you're going to get 10 different answers. And if you're trying to run a business, that's not particularly a good thing. At least like a mar- it's a kind of a marketer's nightmare uh, if that's the case. And so one of the 10K exercises that I've been thinking of and I've been telling younger creators, is like even if you want to be a generalist, because I'm not, I would never encourage someone to niche down because I can't do it. So that's my personal advice. Um, think about your work if it was a book. What would the name be? What would the subtitle be? What would the chapters be? What would unite the chapters? What would be the narrative that unites the chapters? Would it be a series of questions? Would it be a hero's journey type story? Would it be topical? I'm going to talk about money. I'm going to talk about this. And that's a to me, that is a perfect example of 10K work. Because if you're a generalist, you're going to run into generalist problems, uh, which is really positioning yourself in the market. Um, so that people know what you stand for. But if you could, it's a little bit like the format for a reel. It's like, if you can kind of like be like, no, I'm going to always come back to these themes, right? Uh, And this is the way I present them. Uh, A great example is Ramit Sethi. Mm -hmm. So uh, the personal finance blogger, I will teach you to be rich, author, Netflix star now. Um, He Oh, he has a bunch of phrases that he uses all the time. My rich life. I don't know if you've ever seen mm-hmm. seen that phrase. He says that all the time. He's like, my rich life yeah. is, he loves cashmere sw- sweaters, like $800 sweaters. My rich life, my rich life, my rich But like, he had to come up with that. He had to dis- commit to using it. He had to test it. So like, those are the kind of things. And that's how we came up with 10K work, right? Was by just like, kind of really trying to figure out how do we get distill all of our productivity ideas into one framework that is communicable. And, and for me, it was important that it was visual. Yeah, because even like when I w- read that like post explaining 10K work, just the visual and the concept is like, so you can understand it. You're like, wow, I can see how this could be game changing and it can go viral because you've boiled it down to such a great concept. And those things don't just happen. I oh, think yeah. like you like you need to just like you need to actually commit time yep. to thinking about them and studying how like study frameworks. Like I've mm-hmm. studied frameworks. There's pyramids, there's matrices, there's yeah. circular arrows. Like, and I'm trying to be like, okay, like how would this idea fit in circular arrow form? How would this idea yeah. fit in like a step ladder form? How would this so idea fit in a pyramid? <laughs> I guess yeah. Because for, once you nail it, then yeah. it's like it's like 10K work. Boom, like. Like it's off. I wouldn't be on this podcast for the second time if it wasn't for 10K work. So think about the leverage that that this chart has created for my business. Yeah. It, and it just goes to show how you have to take that extra time to, to think about your work, to think about how you want to communicate your message versus just like spitting anything out. You have to put thought into it. And it's very hard for creators because we're always on some kind of like content treadmill. I know. Where it's like, I got to yeah. get the next YouTube video out. Yep. I mean, I, I think life in general, and this is a part of my, the like why I try to figure out what's enough is like, no, like I don't, if I'm, if I don't have any time to think and I'm just beholden like to, to some algo that like needs to be fed, I'm like, I like I would have just stayed on Wall Street, right? It's like uh, you know, I saw the thing. I, it's like to get the max reach on Instagram. It's like seven stories, one static post, one reel every day. I'm like, like no way. Is this investment banking? <laughs> I know it's just become such a hamster wheel that yeah, it's, yeah you don't want to feed into that. 
And that's where 10K work. A, a 10K question would be like, how can I opt out of this or how can I realign this to what works for me? Right. Which is why I've stuck with blogging for so long. Cause it's just like, it works for me. People still like it. And you know, that's the thing, but I'm not also sitting on my laurels, just be like, Oh, I'm just going to be a blogger and newsletter person forever. Cause I recognize that there's others, there's other things like growth is required as well. Um, tell us more about the concepts you teach in your productivity course, supercharge your productivity. So um, aside from 10K work, like, do you have any other like main concepts that you love to teach? Gosh, so uh, a big one, because it is part of 10K work, is what we call 10K questions. And so a, a big part of 10K work, and people always say, I don't know what my 10K work is. And it's like, you need to find the right questions to ask. And so mm-hmm. uh, a very common one that I ask people uh, to do, or, you know, talk about this hamster wheel because they're driven. People tend to find careers with hamster wheels in them. Um, I ask them, am, am I playing the right game? Right. That's a question to re- reflect on. So there's a lot of reflection question. What does success mean to me? Right. You asked earlier, it's like, how do you reposition your life? Like I would, I would challenge you, like, as you said, you know, I would love to have a day where I don't do anything. And so one of your 10 K questions would be, why can't I have a day where I don't do anything? Mm-hmm. Right. And you're going to yeah. get in, you know, that's going to open a lot of YouTube. I'll go this money, this, you know, expectations of audience, this, like, it's going to open up a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then part of it's going to be like, yes, no, you know, Hmm. Interesting. There's some, there's some juice here. Like, let me, let me look into it. Right. So there's a big uh, part of um, of asking um, asking the right questions. That's that's one one part. Another one is um, learning how to say no. So uh, learning how to say no and setting boundaries is is a, is effectively like a ten. We always think of that's another thing about productivity. It's always about adding something or doing more of something. But you reach a point in your career where productivity is about removing the right things. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And setting the right boundaries. And when you get into that, you start to get into concepts of FOMO and, you know, um, kind of fetish, fetishizing, fantasizing about other things. And so there's a whole kind of psychological piece around that. The course is like half philosophy, half productivity. Um, another one that we ask is, uh, it kind of goes back to that quiet thing, is... Um, why do all activities need to have outcomes attached to them? So we really have people break down what we call, or not, we don't call it, but it's uh, from a philosopher where he said there's telic activities. So there's activities that have an outcome and there's atelic activities where the, the, out, the joy is the activity itself. Right. Right. Like listening to music. Yep. There's no outcome. I mean, some people be like, you get pleasure, but like, you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. the joy is the, the actual activity. Act of is it. The jo- yep. And you find with people that sign up for a course called Supercharge Your Productivity, they have everything needs to have an outcome. Mm-hmm. And, but some of life's most beautiful things, like being a loving spouse or parent, there's no out. I mean, yes, you want your kids to like have a happy life, but there's no outcome there. It's just like the time we spend together when we play Nintendo Switch. It's awesome. It's fun. It's exhilarating. It's alive. Uh, and so we help people um, a identify. It's probably the one of the kind of like aha moments. The the funny thing about the course is that most of the aha moments are philosophical, not tactical. Which is actually makes a lot of sense, given everything I've shared uh, in this podcast. So that would be another one is like people like really and people are really uncomfortable. Like when you tell someone to take a walk and not listen to a podcast or or not to listen to a podcast while doing dishes, like people people freak out. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of gently encourage them, like what's and it comes back to that kind of achiever addiction, achievement addiction, which is like, well, podcast makes me better at work. And being better at work gets me more of that dopamine, more of that money, more of that recognition. Mm. And so we really ha- like try to like break that cycle for people. So those are like kind of a few, you know, asking the right questions, observing the mix of your day, obviously identifying what your 10K work is, because it's going to vary by 
industry by by uh, job title and uh, and so on. And then we use the more classic productivity um, approaches of like having capture, you know, having like one like capture inbox for tasks. So very like GTD style um, inbox for tasks. Uh, we have a few different types of to-do lists. So we have project lists, but we have another list that's called domains. So domains are like your health, your family, um, your spirituality, your self-improvement, your, your self-personal growth. Those are like lists that um, they never end, right? And so people don't know. It's the classic important but not urgent. So people don't know exactly how to deal with those so then we and then we bring in like a weekly review to kind of tie it all together make sure you're asking the questions make sure you're checking in on those parts of your lives that don't have due dates so that's kind of how it all ties together yeah so how do you advise people to approach those things and those areas of life that don't have due dates but are the important not urgent is it like do you try to like do something every week or so again the first step always comes uh, just like the awareness around it and kind of looking for inconsistencies. So people will say like, oh, I want to be a great dad, uh, present father, present mother, parent, but they're always saying yes to dinner events at work. So then the first question is like, like observing the disconnect, right? Because sometimes people say they want something you probably see this with YouTube all the time. People like say they want to be a YouTuber. And then when you actually show them what it entails, they're like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. I've fallen in that trap. I'm like, YouTube, being a YouTuber seems awesome. Then I'm like, write my first script. I'm like, this is hard. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I want this. I don't want this. Yeah. So that would be the first one. The second is we tend to encourage um, habits and rituals. So for example, instead of like setting a recurring task to like connect with your spouse, that doesn't work. But if you go on a lunch date on the first Monday of every month, that will work, mm. right? And so we'll think about ways that we can incorporate rituals and habits. Okay. Um, we also discourage people from using due dates, like fake due dates. It doesn't, you know, if you're like, I had a client that his wife said to him, he's like, there's not enough emotional connection. So he had like a, on Thursday at 9 a.m., he had a recurring task that's like emotionally connect with my wife, <laughs> right? Yeah. We can all guess how that played out. And instead, that's where we get kind of the the, the Zamboni, so to speak, to, to, to catch it all, is the weekly review where you go through all of those lists, basically, and just check in with yourself. And maybe you move one thing up into, you're like, oh, I haven't. Um, you know, been around my kids a lot. So like maybe then you actually create a task and uh, create an event like, oh, we're going to go rock climbing together or we're going to uh, do this together. So the weekly review and the weekly review has like a tiny element of reflection mm -hmm. into it. You know, you kind of pick a question or two that really resonates with the moment you're in. And so the one that I use is, did the people, do the people I get love most get my best energy? Mm, right. And I if see. they don't, there's something wrong. Like, what's the point of productivity if the answer to that question is consistently no? Yeah. Like, what's the point? Yeah. Like something's yep. wrong in the system, like yeah. the system design. So again, a lot of it's like finding uh, anchoring to those like powerful salient questions. That, and, and that's a really powerful thing about questions is that they're a little bit more open ended. And the questions that are salient to you might be completely different than the ones that are salient to me. And that's that's the way it should be. Whereas a lot of productivity is like, you should, you know, exercise this way and, you know, write on this day. And like, that doesn't really work for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has to be some flexibility. But I do like your, the kind of weekly check-in and weekly reflection to check into all those different areas. I, I try to do that too. Like we... In our planners, we actually have like a week, it's, it's called the weekly reset planner. So it's similar to what you're talking about, where you reflect at the end of the week, you check into all these different areas, rate yourself how you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think we're similar in that way. I wanted to ask you about like your advice on prioritizing your life, because it's all about prioritizing. Like, how do you know what is the high leverage? How do you know what is what you should be working on? Because we do, sometimes we do get stuck in the leaves, the 
that we think it's helping, like listening to a podcast while driving, we think it's helping, but is it really, right? It's a very tough question. And I'm, I'll, I'll give you a, a kind of a, a simple framework for, for it that, that often gets overlooked. And, and what that is, is that people don't actually know what they really want, right? And so what I will tell people is, we call it a future casting exercise, where you imagine yourself in, you know, it's 2023, it's 2028, in five years, things are going great. Um, you know, your kids, if you have kids are five years older, your parents are five years older, you're five years older. And, you know, you're still like, you're still subject to the constraints. Like if you, you know, if you want your kids to go to school in the United States, like you can't travel the world, right? Because you, your kids have school. So you're still kind of subject to like basic life constraints. What does your day look like? What are you doing? Like, what are you spending time on? Like, um, so if I think about that with myself, like I, I have this, I see this vision of um, like, almost like school of life. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, you know, where it's just like this kind of multimedia philosophy, life philosophy, media kind of conglomerate, right? And I don't know if it's just centered around me or if there's others, but that's the vision that I have. And it's rich with creativity. There's like, a, you're tr like trying to really kind of push the end, like do things differently. And so as I think about my priorities, I try to connect them loosely to that vision. Right. And so like right now, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on short form video. I'm like, how is that connected to, to that vision? And then again, that brings me into 10 K work, which for me right now is like, how do you take all of these ideas and kind of distill them into some cohesive narrative? Right. And so, so you could see that there's like this longer term vision, which is like, that's where we're heading. And then there's kind of a like, you know, a multi-month kind of goal, right? Uh, and then from there, a lot of the thinking and activity. So for example, I'm trying to find like these new terms to like coin. And so then like on a daily basis on social, I'm testing, testing things out, you know, uh, achievement addicts and, you know, deferred life plan. I'm testing them on social, I'm testing them on that. And so they're kind of like, they're all kind of coming downstream from the five-year vision to like a longer term kind of multi like quarterly annual goal down to like the experimentation process in like in between. Okay. So you're always thinking of that long-term vision. That's how you prioritize like what to work on now. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, and this is unique to how I've designed my life, uh, but some people might find it helpful is that I'm a big believer of, like I said, of aliveness and flow. And so like, if something's making me feel alive right now, I'm just going to, I'm going to double down on it. Mm, right. I and so, that. so for me, and that takes me in like, it takes me into like interesting places. Right. So like I said, I've been spending a lot of time trying to teach myself how to make shorts and we're not getting any traction, uh, on the social platforms. Um, but I have like, learned how to edit in the process. I've learned how to script. I've understood lighting and sound. And, and mostly I'm just having so much fun doing it. And I've just added this entire new skill. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not that good at it yet. Uh, but I've added this entire new skill while still that five-year vision is like those, that's what I make the videos about. So like, yeah, I do kind of like, I mosey around, like I'm kind of like a, like a, a puppy sniffing, you know, sniffing its way through the park. And the thing I'm sniffing for is like fun and yeah. aliveness, just like I'll drop things. Like I had this vision that I was going to like make a YouTube video every week. And, and I started that. I was like, this is not for me. Like it, it just, it was, there's so many things that it, it just didn't, didn't work for me. And I just like, you know what? And, and people always say, okay, you should have a podcast. It's like, I don't really feel as strong. I probably should. Cause on, on paper, like I'm a decent conversationalist. I know a lot of guests. I just don't want to. Right. Yeah. And so I'm just I, not going to do I, it. I, I agree with you. Like you, like basically your body, your heart, whatever you call it, knows what 
it wants to do. And I think you should follow it. Like if something doesn't call to you, like don't do it. Just follow what makes you feel good and what gets you excited. Um, I wanted to know, even if you're like the, like, because shorts are so fun for you, it's basically, it's like, it's leading you to where you're meant to go. It's, you're not meant to get immediate gratification and immediate results from everything that you do. Sometimes things are an investment and it, it doesn't make sense now, but it will make sense later. Right. And, and and I just like the, the smile that's on my face while I'm editing (laughs) and cap cut, I'm like, this is so cool, you know, and like (laughs) picking B roll. And, you know, maybe that was my issue with YouTube is that I didn't, there were just too many things to take into consideration on YouTube at such a big scale, at such yeah. a big canvas. And the short, because it's so contained, it's like you have, it's very doable for yeah. any, you know, anyone. And, uh, and again, like I'm not upset that I've gotten no traction on it because I know I can see that my skill has like so improved and I've had fun the whole time. So it's like you, if you improve while having fun and then that's where like the business side of me comes in. it's like, I also trust myself to like, if something's working business wise, like I'm going to find a way to like, you know, make it work for our business. And just like, if it's not working, like maybe, uh, making videos is, will never have a business purpose for me. And then it would just be like a fun little hobby that I do on the side because I like edit videos of my family or edit videos of the local kids skateboarding, like that might be the thing that, and I don't know that yet. And I'm very open to, to all of those possibilities. Yeah. All right. So my next question is, what is the advice that you would give to your younger self? Like given how much you've changed and evolved and given that a lot of the listeners are that age, right? Could be going through the same things you were. So I, I always disclaim this question by saying that there's, there's nothing that I would change about my life because I, I am the sum product of my experiences and decisions to date. And like a very simple, people are like, would you have worked on Wall Street? It's like, I started my newsletter talking about working on Wall Street. So like there wouldn't be a rat reads if there wasn't a Wall Street phase, right? But there's one thing that I do that I wish I would change, that I wish I could kind of go back. And it's the way that, I talk to myself in my own head. So you could call it the inner critic. Um, And for probably 35 years, I was convinced that I had to always be yelling at myself, critiquing myself. It was very, very vicious. Like if you ever, uh, Seth Godin has this post where he's like, the world's worst boss is you. If you ever had a boss that talked to you the way you talked to yourself, you would quit, right? And so I was the world's worst boss and it was savage. And like the smallest, I remember once I dropped my iPhone and, and it just like, there was like a little crack and I I beat myself up, like cursing at myself, being like, you, like you good for nothing. Like you'll never, whatever dream I had that moment, you're like, you'll never have that dream. Like, because I dropped my, my iPhone, right. For like an hour. Right, And there is a view that some people, some of your listeners may hold that like you need to have that voice or some version of that voice to be successful. And I disagree. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot about kind of the, the, the stern Asian dad, right. Or Asian parent, when you disappoint them, like they don't yell, they don't like, you know, I mean, yeah, they don't yell, but they just look at you. And you just like, it's like, you could, you know, you could do better. Right. And I, and so like that, that is like an example. And even there, like there's, in, depending on the Asian parent, there's like, there's like death stares and there's like kind stares. Uh, but I do think that I would have, A, the journey of my life in those years would have been less like intense, like, like emotionally intense. And I, I'm pretty confident that the outcome would have at least been the same and probably better. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, when you beat yourself up, it's not productive at all. Like you're not helping anyone. Yeah. yeah. And it's, 
Yeah, you just and there's a there, your body like your 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 body takes a takes a toll on your on your physical body. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Do you have any last words that you want to share with the listeners before we leave today? Oh, great question. I would just say I want to just tell tell all all of your list anyone listening that like you right now are enough. Like you don't need to achieve something else to be enough. You don't need to prove something to be enough. You don't need to acquire something to be like you as it is in this moment, you are enough. And I think often about kind of like this like Western conception of happiness, which is, again, I'm speaking in general generalities, but Western is like, you know, there's like a goal and you like take your bow and arrow and you aim to the goal. And like when you hit the goal, then you're like, you're happy. Right. And on the more Eastern uh, view of happiness is we're all born happy, but we don't let ourselves see it because of the inner critic and, and all of that. And so I think that like, I think they're both true, but I think that oftentimes, especially people like us who listen to, 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 to who are listening to this are probably more like the goal, you know, the arrow hitting the goal leads to happiness where it's a nice reminder to be like, no, you, you started happy. You started enough. It's just, you may not see that in yourself right now. And so hopefully this gives you one perspective that like, I'm, I'm telling you all that, you know, your starting point is enough. It always has been and it always will be. I love that. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you for coming on the podcast again. This was such a blast to like catch up and hear your philosophies on life. Cause I, I feel like I, I agree with everything that you, you say and how you see life. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and to all, all the listeners, it's, it's, it's an honor. Anytime you're asked to come back, it's just like, it's the greatest, uh, <laughs> it's the greatest honor. And I, I, I take it. Uh, I'm very grateful and um, I'm excited for, for everyone to listen and to, to try some of these things. 